Well, welcome, welcome to another lesson of the Focus on Agility course. I'm Marcelo Lewin, the Headless Creator. As always, email me, marcelo at headlesscreator.com. Today, my guest presenter, Joe Varty, CTO at Agility. He's been here many times, and he's uh, back here to show us this time how to extend agil Agility locales with the Google Translator app. But before we get started, we're, let's have a conversation with him. So let's uh, bring on uh, Joel. Joel, welcome. Glad to have you here again. It's good to yeah. It's good to be here, Marcelo. Yeah, no, I'm glad. Now you're in Canada, right? That's right, just outside Toronto. Just outside Toronto, right? So it's like about three hours difference, I think, over there. Um, so real quick, for those that uh, don't know your background, give us a little bit about your background. Um, well, yeah. So, well, I mean, depends on how far back you want to go, because I grew up in a dairy farm. Let's see. So. When you were born, no, I'm kidding. We don't have to go that far back. How'd yeah, you get I'm, into well, tech. Interestingly enough, um, well, I went to university because I was playing football. So I went to play football at college and it was there that I sort of got interested in computer programming, things like that. So it changed my direction from like an English major to uh, into computer science and been doing that ever since and been with Agility for, gosh, over 18 years now. Now you say football. Are we talking about football like American football or football like <laughs> soccer? American football. Okay, I just want to make sure we, we get it right, because we have a worldwide audience and we want to call it what it is, you know. Um, cool. Now, so you're one of the co-founders, right? No, uh, I was the first employee at Agility. Ah, but, uh, okay, so I misstated it when I said you're a co-founder. I thought you were, but you've been there so long that you're almost like a co-founder. Almost the same thing. Yeah, very cool. And uh, what got you interested in programming? I mean, you said you went from English major to programming. I think it's the the... I mean, I think a lot of developers go through this is when you, you know, you have something in code and you run it and then you see that on the screen, the sort output, of like a magic right. that happens. And yeah. then you sort of get rolling with that. And that uh, feedback it, you get from, yeah. Mm -hmm. Although actually your English major now with what's going on with AI and text prompt engineering, man, that's going to come in handy. Yeah, it's really interesting. I was, I was talking about some folks the other day about that. And then I was like, you know, us, us English folks, us writers, without us, there will be no chat GPT. So. No kidding, right? No kidding, exactly. All right, sounds good. Well, let's do this. Let's go ahead and uh, get started here. I'm gonna go ahead and show your screen. We can see your screen. For those of you watching live, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I'll ask Joel. Joel, I'll uh, let you get started, but if I have questions, which I'm sure I will, I'll jump in and, uh, and ask you. So it's all yours, sir. Thanks a lot, Marcelo. So what we're looking at here is the uh, Agility UI. So Agility is a headless CMS and the idea of apps in Agility is what we're going to be exploring with the Google Translator app today. So an app in Agility can be installed uh, from the marketplace and then it occupies one of the various surfaces within Agility. And looking at the Google Translator app, we're going to be adding that onto this instance of Agility so that we can easily translate into multiple locales. So if I just jump to the settings section for one second here, I can see that I've already got three locales set up. Um, and I only speak English fluently, so we want to use Google Translate to translate into French and Spanish. And you can see that I've used standardized uh, locale codes. Um, they can have regional uh, properties to them as well. So like this is for French Canada, but I've used Spanish with just regular the regular locale code. That's important because uh, Google Translate needs to look at these locale codes as well to kind of uh, Real out. quick, can you, and this is not directly related to the presentation, but can you create custom... Uh, locale. So as a silly example, can I add Klingon here, let's say as a as a locale and obviously, well, you don't know, I mean, that may be a good uh, locale totally. to add. Yeah, absolutely. And lots of our customers actually do that. I don't know if anyone's created Klingon, but some folks use uh, locales as like regions. Um, right. So you know, we've, we've got some customers up here in Canada where they have multiple ver regions that they use that are they're like they're, they're their regions for their departments and things. Um, as long as it has a, a standard part of the locale as part of it, then Google Translate can recognize that. Got it. And by the way, that's an underserved market, the Klingon market. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's <laughs> the, the next billion users. Here we go. There you go. All right. So I haven't installed the Google Translate app yet. So what I'm going to do is actually go to the apps uh, section down here. There's a couple of other places where you can install apps as well, but the easiest place to remember is under settings apps. Um, and you can use any trial account for free to get started on this. And you can see right now I only have one app installed, which is the Powerfields app. So I'm going to go ahead and click install. And it's going to show me all the apps in the marketplace or any private apps I may have written. So there's a, an SDK that you can use to actually write these apps. 
And they, all of the ones that are in the marketplace um, are either first party apps or built by our partners um, that are curated, but you, they're also all open source. So as I scroll down here, you can see there's the Google Translate app. If I click into that, um, there's documentation here. You can see that it's written. This version is written by Agility. It is version 1.0. There is a 2.0 version planned, which I'll talk about later. Um, yeah, and you can actually go right to the code for that as well. So if you wanted to, if you wanted this to work differently, you can fork this repo um, and, and work with it yourself. As long as you're familiar with React or JavaScript, you should be good to go. What I'm gonna do is look at the documentation for this because the way Google Translate works is it's actually going to use your Google Cloud account. So this is a free app, but you need to have um, a paid Google Cloud account for it to work with. Although I don't think I've gone through the trial limits yet. So when you jump to the documentation, it's gonna take you to uh, the Agility documentation site under apps. And there's a whole section here for Google Translate to get this started. And the idea is you're going to use Google Translate to translate a content item in Agility, but we need to set it up so that Google Cloud Translation, I'll just try and scroll here, can do that for you. So you need to go and create a Google Cloud account if you don't already have one. Um, you're going to create a project and, and sort of walk through all the different steps that it, that it tells you here to do that. I'm not going to go through every single one, and I certainly won't do this today because it does take a few minutes to do that I don't want to waste our time with. Um, but it is fairly straightforward. You can do it for free. I don't think in, in setting this up for myself, I use my own uh, Gmail account to set this up. Um, it's pretty easy to do to kind of go through and create the keys, download the JSON file, and then get to the point where we're at here now to install the Google Translate app. Um, and then and they kind of walk through. So the rest of what's in the documentation is actually what I'm going to teach you right now. So I'll jump back to agility. Real quick question before you move on to that. Uh, from an app perspective, um, I know you have a marketplace. Um, what what are apps written in? So they're written in TypeScript or JavaScript. In, okay. And then uh, also right now, I, I'm assuming all, all apps are free. In they the are. Yes, yeah, they yeah. are. Any, any plans on uh, having the ability to monetize if I create an app and be able to sell it through the marketplace? That's a good point. I, the way the way we've kind of seen it now is the apps are are meant to sort of bring in more things to make agility more composable, to kind of be a better composable partner. And so for a lot of the apps that are there, you you, you need to sign up with whatever vendor um, that's connected to. The other to. service, right? So you're already yeah. paying through that. So this is more of a connection point. But that's a good point. Then we may add that sometime in the future. But at this point, everything in the marketplace is free then you have to sign up with whatever service it's connecting to. In this case, it's Google Cloud. Right, right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right. So we're going to, on the on the app here, by the way, this app details screen gives you a screenshot of what's going on there, uh, and it tells you the capabilities. So the capabilities are really what Agility apps provide in terms of like the surface that they that they show you. And in this case, where you this is a content item sidebar, and you'll see what that looks like in a second. The other surfaces could be something like a content list sidebar or the page sidebar or a, a few other areas like that. Lots of different surfaces, but they can also do background processing if they need to. So this app is actually written in Next.js, um, which is allows us to do background processing as well. So I'm going to click continue, and now it's going to ask me for the configuration. And if I've forgotten about how to do all the things that we looked at in the doc site earlier, I could click on here as the additional documentation to kind of go get that. But luckily, I've got all these values in a text document here so I can kind of copy and paste them in. So I've got my Google Cloud project ID. I've got, it asks us for a Google Cloud account email. So this is an email that gets created for that project. And we've got this private key. This is a fairly long value. And I can tell you it's going to begin with a begin statement that says begin private key. And it's gonna end with an end private key and a backslash end. Don't ask me why Google Cloud requires that to authenticate, but it does. Um, at some point, we may update this to do like a connect with Google thing, uh, but this was the for the version one, the, the quickest way for us to kind of get it out the door and get people using it. So you click next from there, and you can see that it's been installed. Um, and so I'll click finish, and we should see it show up in our list here. So that's good. Um, and now it's ready to use on the particular services that it's for. And you remember from the details screen that it told us that it was available on the content item sidebar. By the way, if you need to reconfigure, if you change your Google Cloud stuff, you can come back in here and, and, and reconfigure that app. Or you can uninstall it if you don't want to use it anymore, if you don't want it to show up. So what I'm going to do is click into the content section of Agility. 
So in here, we have containers of content. Um, and then I won't, won't go too much into detail about how Agility works, but essentially this is a list of blog posts, right? And I'm looking at the English list. So I don't have anything in French right now or Spanish. So if I click into one of these, you can see that I can have, I have the Google Translate app that shows up. Now it's not very useful to me now because I don't need to translate anything into, because it's already English. So it detects that, hey, if everything here is already in English and we're good to go then in terms of the text fields. But if I actually switch my language now to French, and this is a basic agility feature for locales, it is going to allow me to copy the values over from English. So I'm gonna initialize this French item from the English item. So it'll copy over not only all the text fields, but also all of the images and other things like that and the date stuff that I might not actually want to translate. And if I, you can see that I'm on the Google Translate app over here, and it's gonna allow me to translate into the current locale, which it has detected as being different. And it shows me all Real of- Real quick, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Joel, just to make sure when you clicked on that, it actually makes a copy of just that entry, not all the entries, right? The entry you picked, correct? That's right, that's right. Yeah, okay. it's a one- so you it's can a... say this entry I wanna translate, but these others I don't. That's right. So it's a one at a time kind of movement at this point. At this point. So I was gonna add that my next question was, is there a mass, a way of doing like, I want, I want all entries to be translated to Spanish, let's say, or whatever? Version two, version two. Okay, but it's in the plan, cool. It's in the plan. Yeah, currently right now, if you wanted to like copy the English values over on mass over to other locales, you can export it to an Excel sheet, change the locale and re-import it And then it import. In. Yeah, so you can do that in, in, and that's how folks, when they have a big long list, that's how they work with it. Yeah. Um, but for a one at a time translation, this is how you do it. Makes sense, cool. Okay, so the um, Google Translate app has decided that, you know, the title and the blog content, so the blog content's down here at the bottom inside of a uh, rich text area. So it has detected, hey, it doesn't look like it's French. So we're gonna select those. There's a, there's a hidden field called category ID, which is also a text field. I don't wanna translate that because I don't want to change the category. So you might have other fields that are text fields that you don't wanna translate, like maybe a product SKU, something like that. Those you can keep the same, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and click on translate and it'll take a second the first time, and but you'll see it has now done a machine learning translation of the title field and the blog content field. And you can see that it detected the, the, the save button kind of lit up over here because it noticed that, hey, we've made a change. So this didn't actually save it. Um, so if I, if I didn't like what it translated, I, I can now change that or, um, or whatever. And I could, obviously this was a machine that did that. So you know, if I'm, if I'm a good English, uh, French speaker, I should go through this and, and double check it. But since uh, we're okay with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and click save. And now that's been set up, okay? So let's continue the process over to Spanish. So if I click quick, into Spanish. Quick, another quick question. This yeah. is more locale related. Um, again, so when it made a copy and you've got all, you obviously just translated everything. If, uh, is the image that's shown in that entry the same image in the English version or is it a copy of that image that I can then localize or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, currently it's the same image. Okay. If I wanted to so localize it's a it. I have... to that image right now, that's to the right. image in the assets. In the so if area. I want a Spanish version of this or change whatever, right? Because sometimes you want to localize your, your images. Um, I would just create a new image and then attach it here. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And you can see this, this URL is not going to change Got right it. now based on all those different things. Makes it's sense. pointing over to the assets area, just like you said. Um, so yeah, I would say the kind of assumption is that things like images and attachments aren't going to be translated by something like Google Translate and you'll right. have to do that. Um, okay. maybe version three, who knows? Yeah, well, maybe and we'll talk a little bit more about AI and ChatGPT and all that, but I'll let you continue. Yeah, um, we're actually in talks with other translation management systems that are starting to do that, to look at attachments and things like that are, are as things that you might want to machine learning localize and then right. review after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's it's in the pipeline as something yeah. we're considering for Definitely. sure. Okay, so let's jump back over here. Um, we're gonna to switch to Spanish now. And now that I've translated this item into French and English, I have that, I can choose those um, to initialize from. So I'm gonna go back to English because I know the English was the source of truth. It was the, the original thing that it was written in. If you translate machine learning into French, then machine learning to Spanish, and then keep on going, I think it's you're more likely to kind of degrade the original version more. So I would always start from whatever is your source of truth. 
um, in terms of the one that was originally uh, created by a human. Or maybe it was the original one that used generative AI on or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and initialize the Spanish version from English. Again, and we should see something very similar to what we had before. Um, it'll you know, basically shows a copy of that item. And then we'll just go through it again um, with the Google Translate once this is finished. Of course, well, that's stream, going so. on. Well, well, that's going on. That's fine. It's a perfect time. Um, I, are there limits to the Google Translate from an API perspective? Um, if you install this, do you have to have like a paid Google account to, to not have limits? Or do you know what I mean? So are there any limits that people will run into? Yeah, it's a good question. So you may. Um, I know that we did this. Um, we, we basically tested this out on a fairly large sort of test system and went through and translate, 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 translate. And I think we got up to, uh, I don't know, six dollars uh, of something. Um, and so that, that it could happen. Um, I think the uh, we actually have version two that we've been testing has is more of like a mass translate feature. So right. what happens then is I think we went up to thirty dollars. Um, in the last couple of days when I've been preparing for this, I've just been back on a free, on a free account that I created and it gives you a certain amount of like free usage and I haven't, and I haven't gone over the free usage. So, so if you, you just, just want to try to keep out, that in mind that, um, yeah. if you're on a free account, you, you may run into, especially if you have, let's say you're a company and you have 10 authors, right. And they're all translating in different languages. You're going to run into some sort of limit. So keep that in mind that you may have to get it like a paid account, which has nothing to do with, um, agility, obviously. That's right. And you can see how we try to keep the app kind of separate from that usage. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, but it's not, this is not using Agility's uh, cloud resources to do the translation. Right. It's using yours. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So we'll go through and jump this in, jump through this one more time. Uh, title, blog content, same, same deal. So I click translate and it's going to pretty quickly uh, do that for us, light up the save. And we've got that now. So pretty basic sort of functionality. Um, if we just expand the sidebar here and go back to the list of blog posts. Now notice I'm still in the Spanish locale. You can see I've only got one item in here, right? So to have to go through this and do for every item, in one case, in one sort of, sort of uh, methodology, it kind of is a good flow because it makes you do it one by one. And I could sort of request approval on these now. Um, to say, hey, to, to maybe have an approver that actually speaks Spanish that can go through these and make sure that they're okay. But from a sort of a bulk point of view, it would be nice to be able to select all of these. And, and the idea would be the version two of this app, I will tell you, shows up on a content list and allows you to essentially push a translation into whatever locales you select. Um, and then you have the option to either only create new items or to actually push um, updates too. So the idea is if I had updated these posts and I wanted to push those updates into the other locales, I could do that from the sidebar as well. So that's what we're looking at from, from a kind of a version two of this app. So the app marketplace is sort of one of those things where, we, where there's the version one and then we can, we can bring new versions in as needed. The, uh, go ahead, Marcelo, yeah. No, I was gonna no, go finish your thought and then I'll ask you. Yeah, I mean the question. The question is, uh, and this is one of the one of the the discussions that we have is, should that be a separate app? Should there be an app called Google Translate, uh, sort of bulk bulk translate, which we might do, so that you. One of the things is we don't want to sort of muddy up the waters with the UI too much, where you've got these apps that are sitting. So if like you can see over time, you could have you know several apps that kind of show up here, and if you're not using them, then then maybe you don't want them. So we're looking at the ability to maybe just have a, a more apps that actually do fewer things, um, or do we build apps that do One a lot of app things that does and a then bunch of stuff? Yeah, yeah. So that's well, like we're a, 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 a Google uh, Translate Mass app. I it wouldn't even belong there, right? Because you would end up um, like it would be for everything. So maybe it's at a different location that you place instead of at the entry level. That's true. Yeah. So we can have apps actually that show up on, on dashboards as well so that it would show up kind of in between right. these dashboards. And then that could give you another set of, uh, of tools. One of the things that we've also done for folks on a, like some folks have built themselves and we've done it custom for some customers where they actually have a webhook that does translations in the background automatically. Um, and so that's another way um, that you could have an app that works. So the Google Translate app 1.0, as we've as sort of released um, as of right now, it does a one-off translation for the content that you're kind of looking at, that content item. 
um, but it can also translate any content item. It doesn't do anything in the background. And we're looking at doing bulk and then potentially background translations. Um, those may be added onto this app or released as separate apps in the future. Are you looking at, um, and I don't want to derail you. I don't know if you have a, a, to continue on when I'll let you continue on asking a little bit after. Sure. Um, one of the things you'll notice uh, right now is that the slug did not get translated and didn't show up in here. So one of the updates that will be happening to the 1.0 version is that you'll be able to translate custom fields as well. So this, this slug field is itself also an app. It's part of that power fields app. Um, but so is, we also have the, uh, there's a block, uh, I'll show it really quickly here. There's a, um, a block editor app as well. That's part of this. There's also a markdown field. So right now, Block editors don't show up, um, so custom fields at all don't show up in the Google Translate. We will be enabling that for anything that uh, that stores its its content in a, in a custom item, and then you know we'll try to be smart about how we translate that. So a lot of custom fields store their content as JSON, um, so that can be tough to translate. But in terms of the slug app, it's just a piece of text. So we could you know obviously you probably don't want to. You don't want to translate the slug, but you might. You might have different URLs um, for the same item in different locales. So we want to make that available to folks to have a choice. So we'll be we'll be making an update to the 1.0, probably a 1.1 version of that to show more fields um, in the options over here. You know, uh, an interesting question that I have on, on, on the URL slugs is if you translate it into Spanish, you may have the tilde on the end or an mm. accent in French. Um, is that I don't I don't even remember to be honest with you. Is that even valid in the URL slug, or do you have to then escape it so you don't show that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you can so basically Unicode is is valid. Unicode characters are valid. Most most sort of content that folks work with is UTF-8. So any UTF-8 character can work in there. So in theory, mm -hmm. it can work. We like to kind of keep anything that's not alphanumeric or a dash or an underscore out of the URL, just to make it easier to, to type um, and to work with. Um, but by all means, you can have other characters that are in there. We actually worked with a, um, some folks who are like, as a right to left language. And I think, it, I think it was Arabic. Um, and they had some characters that I wouldn't have known if it was even alphanumeric right. and th they work just fine in the URL. Um, but you'll notice, I, and sometimes you get this on like news readers where you see like strange characters that just show up in the content. So how you encode those is really important. Um, so sometimes it depends on how the content is going to be pulled into other systems. So we're talking about locales, how you encode your, if you have rich text content or just content in general, whether maybe it's Unicode, maybe it's UTF-8, you get into like those character sets. That, that starts to come into play. You have double uh, double byte characters like traditional right. Japanese and oh my gosh, it just gets, yeah, it, it gets more, more it gets complex tricky. as you move yep. forward. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, the other question is, um, if you have a limit, let's just call, let's say 200 characters in a field, then you use the Google Translate and sometimes in a different language, it may be many more words, right? Uh, and it goes over that limit. What happens? Uh, do you truncate or... Yeah, it just gets truncated, and that's that's okay. where the yeah the the necessity of having a human kind of yeah. look at that um, might be a good idea to in that case to have some kind of warning actually, which is a good idea. Um, that's good feedback, Marcelo. No problem. I'll take ten percent. Um, <laughs> uh, the other way is if you are you guys, do you guys have any plans with uh, Chat GPT because you could say translate and keep it to X number of characters, and I think Chat GPT may end up doing that. Well, what we're looking at is a probably a chat GPT app um, itself to help do things like that. Um, would that work in conjunction with Google Translate? Potentially, um, but it would probably sit on its own to allow you to, you know, have to basically work on the fields that you're looking at in a similar fashion to this to do things like, well, maybe I have a long blog post and I need to generate an excerpt, or maybe I have, you know, a title and a category and Hey, I want you to just write me a blog post for it, um, right, which is right. what which some people like to do, and that can get you get you started on on helping you write. Yeah, definitely, cool. So I think that the th kind of that that kind of brings into question. Well, what's the role of a CMS? Is the CMS there to help you generate content? To help you, you know, I just think to me, a CMS should help you work with your content, however best works for you. 
Um, and so that's why we've, I think that, uh, I believe something like generative AI um, would work really well, similar to how a translate works as an app that you can decide how to install. And then if you want to use a different, like for instance, there's lots of translation services out there. You could very easily jump in, check out how we built this um, in, a, in the GitHub repo and build your own app. And adjust uses... it to your own translating sure. services that yep. you already may be paying. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Um, I'll let you finish or? Yeah, there was, sorry, just one, one other thing is no, like, no, I think that that brings us into the idea of feedback um, is if so, I think that um, we really want to hear from folks in terms of like, what is, you know, does this just, just between you and I, Marcelo, like in our conversation, you came up with, well, what does it do in this case? What does it do in that case? I think that's one of the biggest things about CMS in general is that when you're working with content, there's so many variables and so many mm -hmm. ways that it can work that we really want to hear about that from our customers as part of our like the feedback loop that we have um, with folks. So we really want to hear from from folks about how they want to use things and whatever. And that's why, uh, you know, just sort of if you do have questions or comments or suggestions, uh, we're really interested to hear that. Our, this app was built based on customer feedback and saying, hey, we would love to have a Google Translate app. Um, it was built for a couple of customers, but that's not going to work for everyone necessarily. So we'd love the feedback from more folks to say, well, if it did this or that, that would be really useful. And the feedback can go to your email right there? You can go to my email. You can reach out to us on Twitter, at Agility CMS. Uh, lots of different ways to connect with us. Yeah, totally. Um, if they want to connect with you besides your email, uh, any other? I'm on, I'm on, I guess, we, do we call it X now? I'm on Twitter. And um, it's actually called uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. It's almost like okay. uh, the, the, the Prince. artist formerly, Prince, the artist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, I'm still known um, on X and Twitter uh, at, at Joel Vardy. And okay. uh, love to, love to, I think my DMs are as open as I can get them. And, uh, but uh, love to, to connect with folks there. Awesome. Joel, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, like always. You always do a great job. Uh, great job on the UI. It looks great. So I Thanks, appreciate, appreciate it. That. Yep. Thanks for being here. And uh, thanks to the rest of you for being here. I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode. And as always, if you want to get a hold of me, just email me, marcelo at headlesscreator.com. So we will see you on the next one. Cheers.